Children, please stand for Bible class. Tonight we'll be in, still in Exodus, Sovereignty number 16. Moving right along. I take this as getting to know God in a uh, personal way through His personality or His essence, you could say. So it's always um, refreshing to hear. Um, before we get going, let's take a moment of silent prayer. And for us, that just means that we can uh, confess our sins to God the Father and get in a, uh, be filled with the Spirit. And then we can, we're able to grow spiritually and also apply the Word as He sees fit. So let's take care of that now. Let's pray. <coughs> Dear Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the, all the blessings that we receive on a daily basis, even though we may not recognize them because they're just so numerous. We thank you so much for the support, the faithfulness from your end, and we just pray for uh, faithfulness, uh, continued faithfulness from our end as well and the perseverance needed to continue in your plan. We also ask for clarity tonight in the word uh, so we can understand it in a better way to use it and think with it in our lives. We thank you for these things and ask them all in Jesus Christ's name, amen. amen. So um, one of the major themes we've been talking about in Exodus is, or I think we've been talking about, actually we've been seeing more of this than maybe talking about it, is the, the consequences of choices. We've been seeing that kind of in Pharaoh, right? Seeing his uh, we call them bad choices or, or negative choices. And we're seeing how that's rolling along in a progressive way that God is putting more pressure and more pressure and more pressure as each plague is coming, uh, I guess, next in the list. So um, I had a professor tell me that decisions have consequences in both time and eternity. And that's very true. You know, we, we can we can relate to that very easily, and, and Pharaoh can too. Of course, we know he's an unbeliever at this point. He's e eternally condemned, so his decisions are being used for God's purposes. But at the same time, when we look at him, we can see that God's discipline uh, must take action, whether it is a believer or unbeliever. So it just goes to show you that even our bad decisions, whether they be big or small, right? We we must remember that those decisions have either a, a positive impact or a negative impact, and that's important. Uh, sometimes we lose sight of that. Um, and we talked a little bit about that, how our bad decisions can limit those future options that you have, whether it be in relationships, whether it be in circumstances of life. Um, you can look back and, and think about a time in your life where we were kind of a little bullheaded like Pharaoh and we made decisions in accordance with our pride and you can see how that limited us, right? In a way that was not necessarily would open your options and further extend that opportunity. And that's what I mean when I say it limits us. It's either an opportunity that keeps growing and is able to, God is able to use you to further his plan or we limit that effect in that we limit those options. And God's plan kind of gets cut short as far as a personal uh, you know, standpoint. Not God's plan continues to move, right? The big picture. But as far as our life is concerned, our bad decisions can limit that, that role that we have in the Christian life to a certain extent. So think about the spiritual uh, and think about the physical because they do affect us in this life and they also affect us in the spiritual realm. God has to, he can't do any other thing but to address a sin or a bad, deci bad decision. He has to address um, disobedience. He has to address all these things when we veer from the spiritual life. And I always tell you this, you, you're the ones that are, are held to a higher standard, right? Because you love God. And as a result of that, he holds you to a higher standard because he loves you back. And that's, that's an awesome thing because 
it, we're in a position to glorify God to the maximum. And not only is that important today in our world, because, you know, I mean, just look around you, right? So, and, and mainly for us, we can relate the bad decisions to being out of fellowship, right? That, that's our black or white, light or darkness, the scripture describes it as. Uh, it's either time in or time out. You're either clocked in on the clock in fellowship or you're clocked out. Um, so uh, Chad had it, uh, a light bulb or a flashlight the other day. You know, you, you got to have your power source always intact. And for us, it's the Holy Spirit, right? So uh, it's very important. And that, that's the decisions that I'm talking about. And just remember where sin originates. It originates from our volition. Our, our decisions, right? The choices that we make. We are influenced uh, in many things in our lives, but the very, the, 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 the sin comes from the volitional aspect. So, and then from that point, there's only uh, two different kinds of sin. There's either a confessed sin or an unconfessed sin. And that's how we have to start viewing sin is either it's confessed or it's unconfessed. I know that doesn't apply to Pharaoh, but it does apply to us. They're all unconfessed to him, right? So he can only make bad decisions that are very subjective. Uh, but we have the option. That's a good way to put it. We do have options. Uh, but see how we can limit those options when we stay out of fellowship. So, um, and here's the, what we left off with. We've been through eight. We're actually in the number eight, the plague of the locust. Uh, that's in Exodus 10, 1 through 20. And, you know, I, what I was doing was I was going through this. Uh, I'd kind of misspell Pharaoh. I'd have a tendency to, to just type it this second way. And word wasn't catching it. It wasn't putting a little squiggly line under it. And so sometimes, and then I started to catch on. I'd just correct it. And I thought, well, why isn't it catching the second? So both of these are right in word. So I thought I'd share this with you. Well, which one is right? The first one, right? That's, that's right. That's right. That's the Egyptian Pharaoh. Um, but the second one is actually a, let me read, read to you what I found on it because I, it was just bugging me. I thought, well, what, what is it? Uh, anybody know what it is? It wasn't Scooby-Doo saying, was it? No. What, <laughs> what is what? I said, it wasn't Scooby-Doo saying, it was No, it no, was it? no, that wasn't it. It's a... Um, uh, it's American Pharaoh is a racehorse who is the 12th Triple Crown winner having won the Kentucky Derby. Uh, the Preakness Stakes and the Belmont Stakes. He is the first Triple Crown winner since affirmed in 1978. American Pharaoh's name was picked in a contest held by the racing manager. The original entry was misspelled and enter entered into the Jockey Club's registration site with the misspelling. Now, American Pharaoh has become a trademark name with the incorrect spelling of Pharaoh instead of the correct spelling of Pharaoh. So I thought that was interesting. That's a, actually a common noun now, so that's why it's correct. Anyways, we've got a little sidetracked there. So here we go on Exodus 10, and I want to look at verse 3 because God is telling Moses and Aaron to ask Pharaoh a question, okay? It says, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go that they may serve me. So you can hear the imperative there at the end. Let him go, right? But before that, there's a question. And remember, this is coming from God to Moses and Aaron to Pharaoh. Um. And God is asking a question, how long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Now, one thing to think about is God already knows the answer to this question. And I think the point of this is um, that he's pointing out the issue in Pharaoh's life. He's pointing out the issue to us. He's pointing out the problem. He's making it known what's the whole holdup here. And you can see the holdup. It's humility. It's humility. There's no humility there. So he's saying, how long will you refuse? 
Well, what else comes with no humility? Disobedience, right? So there's two, actually two things in this verse that he's calling out. He's calling out the disobedient part of Pharaoh and the, the lack of humility um, that he's displaying or feeling and thinking in his heart before God. And we talked a little bit about this last time. So the issue in Pharaoh is self-righteousness, subjectivity, which is obviously taking the place of humility here. And I had mentioned that that can be very, very destructive in our lives. Very, very destructive, especially for the Christian, because we do have this same option that Pharaoh has. Even though he is an unbeliever, right, we've still got the option to take the reins from God, uh, reject the filling of the Holy Spirit, and run with a sense of this exact same thing. Now, this is a lot larger scale, right? God's looking for Pharaoh to repent in a way that is to believe in him. Don't we have that on a small scale on a day-to-day -day basis with our sin natures? We do. We do, right? It's just a simple change of mind and repentance to confession. But the, I think the result is still the same. When we go longer and longer out of fellowship, we take on the refusing and the lack of humility goes by the wayside. And I know we, we all try to stay on top of that. You know, that's why we all, you know, it's almost like a, a, a rote memory thing, even though you don't even may not be thinking about it, you're thinking about it. Do I need to confess? I need to confess. You know, it's just like you, you go somewhere, this is what I need to do, right? Or before I get there, you get up. It's just, it's an always kind of thing. And that's, that's what we need to do. Because I think that's the way we can stay clock in as much as possible. Because when we have time out, you know, Satan's not picking on uh, the believers that are a burden to themselves the weak believers. Well, why does he need to mess with them? He needs to mess with you. He needs to mess with the believers that are making a change, making an impact because they're staying on top of their game. Now, when we start to slip, Satan knows that we're in a place where we are very, I, I, you could say, gullible in a way. And what I mean by that is we're gullible to our own sinful flesh. And that's where we start to give in to our sinful desires in a way that is not pleasing to God. So there's always, I think, a, a, a corollary that we can relate from Pharaoh to our specific lives, but it's not on the same scale. But it's the same type of rejection, disobedience, and lack of humility that he, although, you know, I think this is good that we're seeing Pharaoh because he's 100 mile, miles an hour the other way. We're at least on this side to where we can make tweaks and corrections in our spiritual life where we do confess and move forward in the plan of God. If Pharaoh notices something is wrong, like he has been, he has no solutions like confession. What he does have is he has the option to believe, right, in, in God uh, to save, to be for his eternal life. That's, that's his only option at this point. But since you're past that, you have a different option. And that's what God makes, us, makes available to us. So um, and the reason why I said it was very destructive is because it blinds the person to objectivity, which is truth. That's what truth is. It's objective because it's not a personal, it's not subjective, it's not relative. That's us. It's not changing like we do. I, you know, I feel this way, I change my mind. I have this standard, this standard changes the next day. It's absolute and it never changes. So that's why we have to be in tune with this because a lack of humility blinds you to objective truth. And all that means is it blinds us to application in our lives, application on a moment to moment, day to day basis. You know, you look at your life on a day to day, every day, something is going to happen where you need some application. It may not be huge. It may not be a hard test to pass, but it's going to be something. It's going to be something. And that's why this is so important for us is because when we are blinded or misled in the slightest, 
we lose the opportunity to make that application. So um, anyways, uh, just keep that in mind as we, as we move forward. We have to think, you know, when we think about things, we think from a personal filter is one way to think about it. We think from this personal filter and you live your life from that same filter. Now see, if that filter isn't coming through the word, that's when we have issues. That's when we start to be subjective, start to kind of distance ourselves from the word because it, it gets really easy to be subjective when there is no truth, no standard in your life to bounce it off of. So that's the only point I wanted to make on that. Now, I said God is asking Pharaoh a question here, which he obviously knows the answer to, but remember, all it takes for Pharaoh is a change of mind in the right direction, just like it takes us a change of mind. And I think he's asking us the same question when we're out of fellowship. How long are we going to stay out of fellowship? Because the goal of the Christian way of life or the goal of you know, life in general is God wants us to not only be with him, but he also wants to have fellowship with us while we're here on this earth. That's being with him. That's the relational aspect of the Christian way of life. And so the major point here is time in or time out. It goes right back to it. Do we want to spend time in that loving relationship or do we not? Of course we do when we think about the big picture, but we got something inside you that's battling completely against that viewpoint. See what I mean? So that objective truth has to consume outweigh, outpower the time in the flesh or the flesh will win because, you know, in with the truth, out with the false type of thing. Well, when we don't have enough time and consistency in the truth, the false will win and it will outweigh uh, those decisions that we make that, that can only be based on the truth. So I think it's an easy concept, but we just have to uh, take note of the consistency in our, in our own personal lives. So, um, and another way to say this, I think you've probably heard before, is God is always, in, always waiting on us to adjust to his justice, right? That would actually solve Pharaoh's problem. When we lack the humility, when we get prideful and, and, and self-righteous, we're not adjusting. We're not adjusting to the justice of God. And all I mean by that is, um, is that if we wait for an extended period, he will adjust us through divine discipline. Now we have the opportunity to examine ourselves, hold ourselves accountable and adjust to his justice before he takes action in a more serious manner. And we can see that with Pharaoh. Right. That progressive aspect. Pharaoh's just not adjusting. We have a good picture of just, you know, almost just like a, a, a person just standing there and, and making wrong decision after wrong decision after wrong decision. So there's no adjustment there. But we do have the opportunity to make adjustments. So it always boils down to a change of mind in the end. And that's usually the issue here. Right. So. And that's for both unbeliever at salvation and the believer moment by moment throughout your day. We adjust. How do we adjust? Confession. Confession. That is our adjustment. And, you know, I think that's why a lot of people bypass the confessional part of the Christian way of life, because there is a humility aspect to it that you must hold yourself accountable and you have to come to grips with naming your own sins that you committed. You know, th that's easy to say, but that's very tough for a lot of people to come to grips with, even though it's a biblical concept. You know, there's a pride thing going on here. When you can't hold yourself accountable and just simply name a sin, that's all God wants us to do. There's the issue, right? And we can see that that's what reversionism is all about. There, you're in a, 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 you're holding firm in that position, in that subjective position, and your pride is saying you don't need to confess. So what happens is you'll look for different ways to solve 
what sin brings in your life, which is the guilt. Now, remember, we can't do anything with the guilt. All we can do is look for other options that only God can give us the ultimate solution, which is forgiveness. That's the, the solution to the guilt is forgiveness. And so you see these different you know, options in many other ways. You know, we'll go talk to 10 people until we hear the right answer we want to hear. And maybe it justifies our sin. Makes us feel better, right? But see, it never actually takes it away unless it's forgiven and named. And you see, this is going eternal now, right? This is going back to the cross. So you can see how comforting that is to get rid of that and just move forward instead of looking to myself or people to try to solve this. This, this is a spiritual problem, right? Can't solve it with, with human solutions. So, um, so anyways, there you go. That's a, that's a pretty big topic, but we'll go ahead and move on. And I think about how easy, think about how easy this is to do. It doesn't require any physical or mental greatness to do what we're talking about. This is a simple decision. This is a decision that God has allowed each one of us to make to, it's just one decision. I mean, it's multiple throughout the day, but it's the same decision, right? We're, we're going closer or farther away from God. That's one, another way to look at it. So either we're choosing the divine option or we're choosing the subjective human option. So when we talk about adjusting to the justice of God in a nutshell, we could say it means obedience to his word in humility. It's a good way to say it because we're all uh, directed to do to or mandated, directed through his word, how to live in a certain way. And it's no difference with this, right? So. Um, so we have to take, I think part of this is taking our spiritual growth seriously. Uh, it is the most important thing in our lives. So, but it's interesting that no one makes the, the connection that taking your spiritual life seriously has a direct effect on your fellowship with God. Direct, there's a direct connection there. No one makes, no one takes it, it seems in my mind, no one takes it serious enough to where it's, there's a person, personal relationship there, right? This is a moment by, throughout your day type thing. It's not taken seriously. It's just, it becomes a matter of just showing up somewhere, sitting in a pew and going home. I'm talking about taking it seriously like I know you all have done. You wouldn't be here if you weren't, right, on a Wednesday. Um, but that's the point. It has to be something that's part of you. If it's not part of you, the fellowship thing is out here. See, fellowship is a personal and, and something that is very, very deeply connected to God. So keep that in mind. You have to be serious about your spiritual life. Another connection many people don't make is their personal life to their spiritual life. Now, why? I, you know, I question myself, why don't we make that co connection more often? There should be a rollover from the spiritual life to the personal life. Oh, well, well, let me think about that for a minute. That's true. We do have a lot to think about because now I'm talking about relationships. I'm talking about people. I'm talking about how we interact. I'm talking about family, friends, work. How do people see you at work? your spiritual life should relate to your personal life. There's a direct and a parallel that should happen right there. And I realize, that, you know what, that changes as you grow spiritually. Sometimes we're not always in tune, locked in on that point. It's easy for me. Well, what do you do for a living? I'm a pastor, right? That's why, you know, I have to do that. And when I get out of, out of whack, well, guess what? God kicks me in the, and I'm out of there, right? But you get the point. You're not a pastor, but that doesn't mean that you don't have to live the spiritual life. That's the connection that we have to make. We've got to be so serious about the spiritual part of us, and we are, but we have to roll it over to the personal. And that goes in everything. Marriage, children, family, friends, 
how you treat people, right? What you talk about. What are the conversations that you're having? Those are the kind of things that we're talking about. And all these things, I, th I feel like that there are, they point directly to our responsibility as Christians. You know, we've got to start relating these things. It's not just here. It's not just now. It's not just apply every once in a while. This is life. This is a 24-7 job, Christian service, awake, asleep. It doesn't matter, does it? No. It's all, it's all either clocking in time in fellowship or out. So obedience and humility, you can say, is our safe zone in life. That is our safe zone. And it's also how we find God's protection. And that's really where we want to be. You know, we all want to be protected by God. We won't want to uh, run from God because he'll let us run. He'll let us run. We want that protection. And the only way to uh, fully embrace that protection is through that obedience and humility. That's why God is asking, how long will you refuse to humble yourself? You know, it's just like pointing out the fact that, you know, think about this. There's also a time thing going on here. How long, right? And this is coming from God to Moses. How long will this happen? So it really keeps us out of trouble. And I think obedience and humility is one of the main sources of joy and contentment in the Christian's life. That is a fact. Obedience and humility to God and His Word and that re relating the spiritual life to your personal life, that's an important part of this, is where we find this joy that the Scripture talks about, this contentment in our lives. That can only come through the connection of obedience and humility. It can't come any other way because that means we're consistently asking and wanting solutions from the spiritual source. That's what that means. That's what we want. And God honors that. God protects us. He honors us. And He gives us these things that His Scripture promises us. It's not just words, remember? A lot of these things are fruits of the Spirit, right? That we have access to and we can live with. So, so don't, those are two key things. I think they're definitely related, obedience and humility. Uh, of course, we know for Pharaoh, true obedience would be a change of heart through regeneration, right? And, or he could just, there's a part of this, he could just let the people go. You could say, well, that's some humility. That's, you know, recognize, I think that's more a recognizing pain and wanting to live, really. Uh, survival, the basic mode of survival in a human. But God's discipline does humble people, especially unbelievers, to get to a point to where they can accept. You, you know, you all know the stories and you've heard the people and you know in your own experience that God, before you became a believer maybe, or he, he, you were humbled. You have to be humbled to a point where you can look up and say there is an authority, authority higher than my own. That's really the issue here. Because before that point, the person is in authority. There, there's no other authority outside of the human being. So it goes right back to this, humble, humility, right? Pride. There's a, there's a definite, definite arrogant part of this. And I'm not, I'm not saying that in a mean way. I'm just telling you about the, the, how the human body works with the sin nature. We want to rule. We want to be in charge. We want to know everything. We want to be first. And we, you know, the list goes on and on and on, right? But when you're talking about living in a life that way, that's a very dangerous place to be without God because you're running on decisions that are based on what? Relativity, subjectivity, not good things. And that's what, that's what we see in Pharaoh. That's what we've been seeing. And you see the result, right? The plagues are still going. They're still going in the, in the wrong direction. So... Um, so God wants us actually to, to do this in a natural way and do it through a volitional. There's a volitional aspect of this, right? He desires 
but he can't force. That, that's part. He, can't, he doesn't want to force. He wants you to make your decision to want, and, and that obedience part, that takes a responsibility on our part to move forward. Remember, God draws, but he doesn't pull you with a rope and, and just you know have a knot around it. He draws, he influences, he desires, but he doesn't force when it comes to your spiritual life. Um, and, and as far as growing and having these things like contentment, he's not going to get you to a place. We have a responsibility in that is what I mean. And that comes with that decision, uh, the volitional aspect through just making, you know, making right choices. So, um, but God knows it's not going to happen for Pharaoh, at least on his own. He, he knows at this point that it's not going to happen. Because remember, God is in the, the one that's hardening now. He, he jumped in the picture on plague number six, I think it was, right? After five, after five rounds, here comes God. The Lord is the one hardening the heart, the heart now. Exodus 10:4. For if you refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow I will bring locusts into your territory. Now, you don't think about, you know, okay, locusts, not that bad. Um, right. When you see what it, the scripture says about it, you start to think. It was kind of like the frogs. You know, okay, yeah, frogs, that'd be fun. We can fry some up. But when you heard about all the places those frogs were, just like this, it says, listen to a few of these things that the scripture tells us about it. It says that they will solidly cover the surface of the earth. That's one thing. So that no one else will, be, no one will be able to see the land. That's a lot of locusts. It says the locusts will also eat the rest of what survived from the hail. Remember the hail destroyed a lot of their crops. That's a, their well-being. That's their life, right? That's their food source. It's probably they sell. Now there were some left. The scripture did say, well, they're going to take care of the rest. They're going to eat it. Locusts. And it says their houses would be filled with them. Now, I can't imagine filled to the top of the ceiling. But what if it is? That's a possibility. Filled means filled, right? I, I can't say that I'm not going to interpret this as an analogy or allegorically. Let's interpret it literally. Filled means filled. So that, you know, that, that's a lot of locusts. Now, something that they also, it says that they had never seen before in their whole life. Uh, pretty obvious that that is true, right? Now, Moses then went to Pharaoh whose servants. Now, Moses servants are at this point, they're trying to talk him in to letting them go. Remember the magicians did it first and now his servants are doing the same thing. They're saying, hey, you know, Moses tell them about the, the little locusts and now they're saying, hey, let them go. Just let them go. Now here, here's what the servants told him. Pharaoh's servants said to him, how long will this man be a snare to us? So now Moses and Aaron, they're the problem. Let the men go that they may serve the Lord their God. Do you not realize that Egypt is destroyed? Is destroyed. You know, that's one of the things that, that subjectivity will do for you. Even though things are crumbling around you, we will still make decisions in the wrong direction because we think there's a solution at the end of that trail. If we think we can solve a problem, take uh, the... The world, for example, take the environment, for example, if we think we can solve that problem, we will make decisions all the way until we get to our goal. But see, it's not reachable. And by the time you get to where you want to go, everything has fallen apart. Right. And this is one of those examples right here. Pharaoh is making very bad decisions. And they're saying, hey, man, Egypt is destroyed. What, what, you know, kind of like wake up. This is what you've done. So. And they even tell him, let the men go that they may serve the Lord, their God, because that's what Moses is asking for. So now they're they're promoting uh, to make for Pharaoh to make the right decision. Now, as a result of this, Pharaoh tells Moses and Aaron. 
go worship the Lord your God. He says, go. He says, go. But before they left, he asked Moses, who all is going to be going with you? He asked him a question. Who's, who's all going to go? You know, he's not just saying go. He's saying, well, wait, who's all going to go? That's, that's what he's doing here. And now this goes right back to the pride thing, doesn't it? Remember how all this started. Pharaoh was nervous that the Jews were going to become too big and they were going to take control. He's still there. And what this does, now we're, we're talking about a lust pattern that Pharaoh's in. This is a power lust, right? It's a control issue for Pharaoh. And what happens with people that have no hope, have no source of uh, contentment in their life through God, they are very, have a lot of anxiety. They are very, um, they always think things are going to fall apart. They're not sure. And they're always on the verge of just jumping ship because there's no surety. There's no absoluteness in their life. So you can see that Pharaoh's still, he's questioning because he's worried that the Jews are still going to take over. That's what he's doing. Um, and this is just a spinoff of arrogance, right? Power lust. But all I wanted to point out is this with this kind of lust, when you're looking to yourself for these kind of solutions and to keep your arms over something and in control, that comes with a lot of paranoia. You're always paranoid that someone's going to come and take either take your job, take your position, take something from you. You don't trust anybody because you're relying on yourself and you know you can't trust yourself. Right. So. That's where Pharaoh's at. Very, very, very subjective, irrational decisions. Um, a good example of this is how China is dealing with COVID-19. It's a good example. How you can make irrational decisions based off a power lust, a controlling issue and how you're dealing with a problem. Look right here. Egypt is destroyed. Isn't that what it's, what's happening to the people over there? You know, they're like being starved and everything like that. I mean, it's just crazy, right? Because they want them to stay in their homes. It's bad decisions. I think sometimes I think they would like to do the same thing here. But luckily... There's enough people, I think, that have enough truth in their soul where we kind of broke out of that, didn't we? We kind of broke out. We were still it's still lingering there. But I think we've mostly broke out of that because there's barely enough people that can see, hey, this is this is stupid. Right. What are we doing? So. But, yeah, the, you know, they've still got their tentacles grabbing for that one. Um. But that's just that power, that control, lust issue that I'm telling you about. That's decisions that are subjective and they're not based on your health. They're not based on you. They're based on a another somebody else's sin nature and their objectives when it comes to control is all that is. So Pharaoh asked Moses, who's all going to go? And Moses answered him, answers him in verse nine. He says, Moses said, we shall go with our young and our old, with our sons and our daughters, with our flocks and our herds. We shall go for we must hold a feast to the Lord. So he's basically saying where everyone's going. Everybody's going here. Right. Now, here's Pharaoh's response. He says, no. Have only the men go and worship the Lord, since that's what you have been asking for. Then Moses and Aaron were driven out of Pharaoh's presence. Now, this is kind of a turn, you could say, right? This is the definite turn. You know, I didn't really expect this to happen, but it just goes to show you how far the other direction, the hardening, what it does. You know, if he senses now, Pharaoh's thinking about what the Jews taking taking over, maybe killing him. That's what he was concerned about from the very get go. 
He's still nervous about this. And he says, no, there's too many of them going. They're going to group up. They're going to team up and they're going to take over Egypt is what he's thinking. So now another thing to note here is that look what he says. That's what you have been asking for. Well, you know, I thought, well, is Pharaoh right? I had to go back. I had to look at each instance of when Moses asked, this is a lie, is what it is. But it's a good tactic that they will use because, you know, when something happens over and over and over again, you know, you kind of lose track of what happened, who said what, when they said it. And all of a sudden, now you can just throw a lie in there and even the person that doesn't know whether it's true or not may believe it. That, that's how well it works a lot of times. And I had to go back and look and say, you know what? Moses never said that he was just going to bring them in. He said, my people, every time, my people, my people. So you can see the tactic right here, a lie. And he's lied before, right? This isn't a surprise to Moses. He's not surprised, but it just goes to show you, I'm sure he caught on to it, but there's no point of addressing it. I mean, what, what's the point in saying, no, I didn't? You know, you're just almost going in the, the, the wrong direction there. So anyways, we just saw it in verse 10, in verse three of chapter 10. How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go so that they may worship me. Right there, same chapter, right here. And I looked at all the other ones too. So uh, it's just a flat out, flat out lie. Now, it, it, to make the situation even worse, what does it say? It says that they were driven out of Pharaoh's presence. Now you would think that at this point in the game, that this would go in a different direction, but this is the PL stem. So what is this saying? There's an intensification here of driving them out. This isn't just, hey guys, let's escort these guys out. This is running them off. This is shooing them out in a way that is not very pleasing, not very nice. It's basically, the word means, um, well, just what it says, driving them out. So um, not, not, very, not a very, um, pleasant thing that Moses and Aaron experienced there. It means cast out or ran off as well. And then we have the same thing we've been seeing. Moses enacted the plague. Pharaoh squirmed, asked Moses to pray to God and forgive his sin and to remove the plague. What do we see? A consistent theme. What does God do? Honor Pharaoh's request to stop the plague. Get rid of it. Clean it up. And then verse 20 shouldn't surprise you at all. Here we go to the end. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart and he did not let the sons of Israel go. No surprise, right? We knew God's plan. We knew what he was doing. We know how this direction this is going at this point. God's desire is to not let the people go from Pharaoh's perspective. He's hardening his heart so that he does not let the people go. Why? Because he wants to demonstrate his power his sovereign power to us and the people there, right? And I think the reality here is that God's overruling will is at work. We can see that, no doubt, we can see it. Um, it's just that it's not always as visible or known to us as we can see it here in Exodus. But think about it, it's always at work. It's, it's always at work, isn't it? God's plan is moving forward in the exact way that he wants it to, no matter what. I, I say that's overruling will. God overrules in the sense that it's moving exactly in the direction that he wants it to. And we can see that even in Pharaoh, the evil Pharaoh, the unbeliever, it's all moving in God's direction, almost like Pharaoh's making the right decisions. Isn't that crazy? An evil person, nothing to do with God, but he's making decisions in accordance with God's will and plan. Wow. Now that tells me that his will will always be moving in the direction 
he desires. That means despite our decisions on how good, bad the circumstances are, the number of people in oppositions to God, or even those in the United States that seem so numerous that are spiritually lukewarm, despite all these, uh, you could call them issues, they're not problems to God, right? You can call them personal problems. That's a good way to look at it. These aren't a problem for God. They're not a problem because guess what? He's going to still move in the same direction as he always was in accordance with his will. And he's going to use every one of those decisions to glorify himself. And what do we see is the other benefit of this? His people. His people. Now, when we see evil, bad things happen, enemies inside our country, enemies in our government that are trying to take down our country, enemies in our school system. When we see these, this evil, think about Pharaoh. Everything's moving in this direction. Every, God's will is moving in this direction, and he's going to use every one of those evil people for his purposes. That's what he's going to do. So don't ever get down. Don't ever get, you know, oh, this, they're going to win. You know what? They may think they're going to win, but God is going to use that for our benefit and to glorify him. That's just how he works. That's how powerful God is. And we can see that right through Pharaoh, how he does that. And, you know, how can we look at this every day? You know, we see all these things in our life and how can we apply this uh, since there's so many variables, so many different circumstances and things that will happen that you don't necessarily expect. And one verse that I wanted to look at that I think how we can apply that it's all moving in this direction no matter what. Good decisions, bad decisions is 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. And here's the verse. And we'll probably get into this next time. But this is, I think, is a good application to know that God is sovereign and his plan is moving forward no matter what. You know, there's three imperatives here for us to keep in mind. And these are important. It says, rejoice always, Pray without ceasing and in everything give thanks for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. This is how we can apply whatever we see as far as evil and enemies and everything that we see is bad right here. Because we know for a fact that it's all in God's hands. And I wanted to just step through each one of these and look at them. But we don't really have time tonight. But I think this is the second it is actually the second. Let's look at, you see this verse, it's only consists of two words. The first one, verse 16. And this is actually the second shortest verse in the Bible. Does anybody know the first? Jesus wept. Everybody always says Jesus wept. It's actually not Jesus wept. There, Luke 20, 30 is actually the shortest. See, y'all are thinking about the English words. If you take it down to the Greek, it's Luke 20, 30. Jesus wept was, I think, 16 letters in the Greek. And then you got, uh, or sorry, yeah, Jesus wept was 16. Then you have Luke 20, 30, which is 12. So anyways, just to, when I saw the verse, I was like, wow, that's got to be the shortest. That's actually not. That may be the second or third, depending on how you look at, at the words. Then you got a, the Hebrew is a different, different animal. Do you count the vowels? Do you count the consonants? Whatever. But this is roughly the second. But anyways, um, so when we come back on Sunday, let's look at these different words because this is so much application for us every single day. And I think it's a big part of where we fit into God's plan, just move in that direction. And this is all fun right here. This is where we find that contentment and where we find, look at the power that you see on verse 17. If it's, his will is moving that direction, no matter what, and you have input into that, that's powerful. That's powerful. And to think that we can make changes from our perspective, not God's, 
and your, your prayer has impact and it, and it does go to him and he answers that prayer, that's exciting to me. It should be to you. So anyways, let's, uh, let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the understanding, uh, for the clarity that we can get through it. We know that uh, Pharaoh is a great example of who you are and what you can do through evil people that have absolutely no idea that you are working their bad decisions to your glory. And we're so thankful that you can do that. And that's why we rely on you. We trust you and we love you. And we know that we can find happiness and contentment in you. We thank you for all these things. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.